Hi, and welcome back to Old Time Radio. Debbie Higgins and myself, Barbara Holstein, we are here to take you back to some relaxing, fun times, like when we were kids and we could just chill out with some of the programs that were on the radio. We're going to talk about subjects close to our heart and things that might interest you. We will be careful to not reveal too much if it's inappropriate, but we're happy to share lots of fun and crazy things that have happened to us. So Debbie, here we go. Well, I don't know about you, Barbara, but I feel a little bit rusty because we haven't been on the air in a while. So uh, we're, you know, we got to scrape yes. off the dust get the rust-oleum yes. for the rust, like the Tin Man, get our joint okay. going, here we go. Oh, I agree. <laughs> and I don't know if you realize it, but I was looking up the numbers of people that are watching old time radio. Of course, they may not watch it at the moment, but they may pick it up a few days later or whatever, either on YouTube or Facebook. And on YouTube, uh, no, I'm sorry, not YouTube, but on Vimeo, where I also place them, all of them have had more than 500 views. That's fantastic. But yeah, yeah, it is. I think that people want to enjoy listening to things that are not catastrophic, but they do arouse either a little pleasure or a little tension. And that's what we're going to offer. We're going mm -hmm. to start with a topic that I think is particularly close to my heart, and you'll know why when I share it, and that is transitions. Of course, we go from transitions from the moment we're being born till the moment we die, uh, but we don't talk much about them, and, and we don't really give people much help or support. We're sort of left alone a lot of times to do our transitions. So my big transition, is that we moved from a house to an apartment and people really didn't tell me much except different ways to find movers and stuff like that and make sure you go through all your stuff and throw out stuff. But what they didn't tell me is that I was going to feel like I had just come home from burying a loved one you know, that, that last time of really being the owner and part of this house was beyond what anyone had even suggested. One reason was because we lived there so many years, and I understand that that builds into it. But I've done a lot of thinking and crying since we moved, Thank God the crying is diminishing. That's a very good sign. Um, but I think what we don't realize is that the good part, I'm going to jump to the good part. The good part is that I think the brain starts to realize that we really haven't lost anyone. Of course, we can't go to the house because the new owners wouldn't really like that. But everything that we achieved in the house or was special in the house really is in our minds. You know, the new people are, are going to walk into the front hall. I'm going to just use my house as an example. They're going to open the front hall closet and they'll probably say, mm, small closet, I wish it were bigger. Now, when my parents came to see the house years ago, and my father opened the front hall closet, what he said is, Barbara, this could be a good, very tiny bathroom for people to use. And I said, Daddy, but you know, there are no pipes. The pipes are in a different part of the house and it would probably cost a lot and whatever. But my father liked that idea. And for at least 10 years, whenever they came, aside from, uh, wanting to relax and maybe have a little little bit of scotch that I saved for him, he would go to the front hall closet and open it 
and say, I still think it's a pretty good idea. And that's a memory that the new owners couldn't even understand. It has nothing to do with them. It isn't in their flesh. It isn't in their woodwork. It's nowhere. It's in my mind and I can still have it. So that is something I'm now discovering as I come up from the actual move. Well, another thing that the audience should know is that you moved from an early 20th century house that was built in probably 1910. I'm not yeah, sure. About 1910. About 1910. I can tell about the architecture to a very new modern building in a different town. Um, and you had a beautiful lake. I don't want you to get crazy now I'm thinking about the house, but you had um, a lot of trees, lake, and actually the place you moved in, there are people that are living there that think they've hit the end of, you know, one man's ceilings, another man's floor. They think it's gorgeous and it's spacious and they have a balcony and they can see the ocean and all that. But when you come from a place of history that you really, really appreciate, it's very difficult to leave it, especially when you don't know what the new people will do to it. You know, it's like a, it's like a, a, a lady from the Gilded Era with a, with a, a, a dress on that nobody, that's not in fashion anymore. And the new people don't want that fashion. Yeah, right. And that's the thing that's kind of sad because if you were moving from modern to modern, then you wouldn't be probably, you know, feeling the way you do as much. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, that's a good point. And you moved or you you were you sort of were in and out because your mother was right. in a home way past you staying in it, but yeah. you also left behind uh, an almost gilded age older okay. home. So Our, you know, that house was built in 1897 and it had probably the most magnificent stained glass. The new people didn't like it. They took it out. God knows where it went. Um, it was huge, nine bedrooms. And it was beautiful, but it was, you know, it was very, very hard to maintain a type of house like that unless you are making in mid six figures probably at this mm -hmm. point. Especially another transition is the fact that we realize I started realizing when I hit 60 that I couldn't do the things that I used to do. So you have to pay the guy to mow the lawn. You have to, if you don't have a handy husband, you have to pay somebody when there's a problem. Like, like today, I just got my water bill. It's normally $80. It was $285. And I'm like, what's wrong here? And I don't even know who to call. And, and, and that's something that's a transition that we have to take on less. It's like baby, to adult and then back to baby, I guess, you know, I mean, but um, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I want to just give a plug for uh, one family, one particular man that lived in our house um, because I think for me, he created some of the magic and uh, excitement about um I guess the spiritual wor world, all sorts of things that I never met him. I never knew him, but his name was SS Adams and he was a joke and magic inventor. He invented and had the patent on many, many, many uh, jokes. If you ever sat on a poo poo cushion, that was his. If you ever had someone shake your hand with a buzzer noise going off, that buzzer was his invention. I don't really know his magic jokes, a uh, magic tricks, but he did patent several hundred of them also. And I always felt from the time that I we moved into that house that somehow there was some magic there and there was some uh, special feelings. And uh, there was a neighborhood story that went around when we first moved in that he had had a fight with one of his four children, a son, and claimed that um, the son was not going to get his inheritance, but it would be in a wall somewhere. So, of course, my husband 
went diligently through the house and the floorboards and all sorts of things. We never found any money, but we did find a joy buzzer and we found some um, paper money that, you know, the toy money that you would use like a monopoly. So yes, it's interesting that even leaving the house meant even separating out from this family I never knew, but they had protected the house for many years as we then did. And um, that's the way it is. And talking about transitions brings a lot to mind. To me, I remember as a little girl, five and a half years old, we're moving from New Haven to Bridgeport at, from an apartment and to a bigger apartment. And the moving truck is in front of us and we're following it. And I started to cry because my red bicycle, which was the pride of my life that my father had taught me how to ride this two wheeler was on the back of the moving truck. And I was afraid it would fall off. You know, to me, I couldn't, I was only five and a half. I was going to lose that bike on the way to Bridgeport, you know, but I didn't. However, the move was not easy because going to kindergarten for like two days, I then was home for three weeks with mumps. So, you know, <laughs> life intervenes at every step of the way. Yeah, and I, I have a transition of my own going on. I sold the other house and it took a big decision to decide whether I was going to stay in this three bedroom, beautiful neighborhood that I live in house with a lot less room. It's got 2000 square feet. The other house was 21 rooms. So you can imagine the square footage on that house. And I decided to be here. But I decided also to put an addition on my house. And that might have been easier back 10 years ago. But with the way things are with the economics in the country now and also the supply chain, it's I have no idea. I asked my contractor, when are you going to be done? He says, I don't have any idea. And they dug this giant trench. If It's like a Jimmy Hoffa thing in the backyard. If anybody has a body to bury, bring it over here. We'll put it in the ditch. But um, that's going to be a gaping hole. And he said they ordered the next thing, but it could be up to two to three weeks before it comes. And that's something that would be done in two months. And that's a real transition. And also, um, my son moved home with me which was also a transition, but it's turning out to be a pleasurable thing because in January um, I fell and broke my back and my son is here to help me. And I just say, blah, blah. And one second he does it. And that's a wonderful thing. So it's been, it's it kind of seems like things have some kind of divine protection over them lately. And I don't know if it's, I always thought it was my grandmother and I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but I, but I find that, Things happen and they seem, they may be difficult, but something serendipitous happens to make them, to make you think, wow, what that's amazing. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's gone on, you know, and that's kind of the transition I'm going through. And also I had a job for 16 years that ended that I was very difficult and I loved it a lot, but um, my, my boss retired and he said, that's it. And it, that was a big part of my life. And I, I feel sad about that. But of course. when a door closes, something else opens. Yeah. 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 That's all. That's true. And I heard this uh, interesting saying that someone was sharing that, um, you know, we have coincidences that happen that really often take us forward in life. Yeah. Like I've had a client at times who mentioned a particular physician for some reason or other, and I'm able to pass that information on to someone else. And once or twice, it helped me, you know, to just pick up on something. But the, the a remark that was made is that coincidences are God's way 
of hiding while he set something up to happen. Okay. I think that was really quite lovely. I like that. Yeah, I want to believe all those things. Yeah. Definitely. And um, I've had a nice thing happen that I would consider um, an outpouring. Um, well, uh, that's maybe not quite the right word, but um, when I was a little girl, I had a pen pal and she lived in Wales, except it wasn't much of an experience because, well, we were each only maybe 12 and we wrote two or three times and then it faded. And then, you know, a year later in a little girl's room, you can't even find the envelope to write to the kid again. So it was dead. But uh, one of the women that's been very supportive to me Jeanette Pintar, if I'm selling, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly, who is a wonderful, wonderful friend that I've never met in person. She lives out west somewhere and she raises the most amazing chickens that are so gorgeous. The only thing is you would never eat chicken again, never, you know, and she's very, very helpful in many, many ways. She is a minister by training and all sorts of interesting things. So she has a friend in Wales and she thought that we would like each other. Uh, the friend is a therapist there. And yeah, I think we are gonna like each other. So I'm, I'm gonna have a pen pal again in Wales. And nice. maybe someday I'll feel safe enough, you know, with the pandemic, uh, wherever it is, maybe less and less, or who knows, I pray for a nasal spray, something like that. Uh, so we'll meet. So, yeah. Is there any other transition that particularly stands out on your mind, Debbie? Um, I just, well, the transition I'm feeling now is I kind of have always been a push the edge of the envelope person. I've had a life that had, I've done so many things and had mostly um, theatrical things. And I just feel I want something new and I don't know what it is, but I've got to figure that out. And I also, this is the silliest thing in the world, but I, and I will tell people to do this if they can. Um, Yellowstone, the show that was, uh, it's on um, uh, Peacock now with Kevin Costner is probably one of the finest things I've ever, ever seen on television. And it's so authentic about horses. I'm going crazy now to, to see horses. So I looked all the show schedules up and I'm going to see the horse shows and I, I'm going out to the sale. There's still a horse auction and there's still a pro rodeo in New Jersey. And I'm going to make it a point that I'm going to do that this summer. And I love that stuff. And I haven't done it in 15 years since I moved here. So I'm kind of transitioning back to that. And I, I'm, I'm, went, I'm going to the gym because I want to get my back strong enough that I can ride again. That's one of my goals. Oh, that's part, so that's part of my psyche, you know? Yes. Um, yes. So that, that's pretty much it. You know, my transition, I'm waiting for this kitchen to get done and uh, make my house bigger. Then I'm going to do a memorial for my mother finally and have everyone here. And um and maybe cook, teach cooking classes. So I want to take my life in a new, exciting direction. You make it even bigger and fun, funnier and funner, fun. And it's a great step you're taking. I would say that the two things that are coming to me as I come out of this, one is I want to write material that will help people with transitions to understand more that the energy that we need to feel good is never like in a wall or car or house. It's, there are atoms in these things, I understand, but the energy that really fills us is a different type of energy. And we can always have it if we know how to get it because being alive is making that type of energy. And when we, when we get upset because we can't get to a certain uh, experience or place, yeah, it can be very, very disappointing. But the reserve of energy is still there to
to transform into something else. You know, if you can't get to, I haven't been to Broadway since the pandemic, but I have seen more interesting series than I've ever seen in my life because of Amazon Prime and Netflix and, you know, things like that existing. And my other dream, which I'm going to, I hope I'm not, well, I'm going to say it aloud. I think I'm entitled to, and I think I've really put in the time that it's a reasonable dream. It, it may not come out exactly as I'm saying it, but um, I think that one of my books in particular, um, which is sitting, where is it? I covered it up, but let's give it a little plug. Around Every Corner, Romance and Mystery. And we're going to do a reading from this book in a couple of weeks where we'll be rehearsing. And uh, we'll be doing a Zoom drama based on this. This is such an interesting plot that takes place between two, uh, around two women best friends since college, um, a husband, a lover, another lover, uh, Jerusalem, a mystery woman who teaches them a lot of things and all sorts of um, just amazing situations. Uh, Diamonds, diamond business, um, criminal behavior, belly dancers. Somehow I threw it all in here. I have to thank my mother because I think that this never would have happened. After she died, I was writing it late at night and I think she helped. I really think she helped. So what my dream is that um, the storylines from this would end up a film or a series or something like that. It's good enough. I'll have to put in a lot of work and energy and, and, and we'll need some uh, serendipity things happening. So maybe coincidental things, maybe some accidental things. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but that's something that is really exciting me. Yes, it sounds good. Yeah, I like all that intrigue, especially belly dancing. I love all yes. that, like yes. that mysterious <laughs> stuff, you know. Um, so anyway, we were going to talk about a couple other subjects. Yes, please. Do you want to talk about um, a chance meeting that we had that led to a whole nother world, or do you want to talk about some summer things now that we love? Well, let's just do summer quickly first. Um, summer can be amazing, is amazing, some of my memories, although I had very ordinary life. I did not do anything strange or different, um, you know, but uh, the smell of copper tone just lifts my spirits. Sometimes I think I should just buy that sun cream and use it all year round, you know? What were your favorite things? I have certain things that I have to eat every summer. And one is a one is a Max's hot dog. I have to go to Max's for a hot dog. I have to have a sausage and pepper sandwich at a fair. Like uh, usually the Italian festival down here, they go there and have that. I have to have soft shell crabs, which I love. And um the, um, we're very lucky here where I live because a little ice cream man comes down the street three times a week. Wow. And it's really exciting because it has the best jingle and you can hear them coming in the development and all the kids and the parents run out. And I went up to the ice cream man last week. He has 30 different milkshakes. Wow. On this truck. So I had a pineapple one. Everybody goes pineapple. It had giant chunks of pineapple in the bottom. It was so fresh and so good. So, I mean, uh, uh, and another thing I really remember that I miss and I loved was um, Convention Hall, all the rock concerts that I went to. I saw everybody and the tickets were like, well, I used my allowance and I was young, you know, like preteen and I'm a young teenager and, you know, I had enough money where it wasn't even something that was a big issue. And I just have to get tickets for Earth, Wind & Fire, PNC, and they're over $250. It's crazy what's, you know, 
so that I, I remember and I remember, you know, just wonderful uh, rides and just the, I, it, yesterday we were on the beach, we were both on the beach and just to see all the colored umbrellas, how beautiful yes. they are. I mean, the little things you really appreciate the beauty of things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember, uh, my father and mother and my grandmother and some other relatives, we pile into the car and we go to Savin Rock in New Haven. That was the amusement park. And um, first we go to Jimmy's or we go at the end. And Jimmy's, you got a hot dog and you got crunchy French fries. Mm. They were, I mean, it was amazing. It was the most amazing. We loved it. And my mother and my aunt and sometimes my grandmother, they would just sit on a bench and watch people watch. But my father would take me around and we'd go on the flying horses. And, you know, you tried to get the gold coin uh, ring, which I never got, but somehow it was a treat each time. And then we went in the fun house. And the fun house had, you know, crazy mirrors and floors that slanted. But the most amazing thing, and I've never heard of this in any other park, was you went into a room where, where, there's a, where there was this giant dish and you sat on the dish and there'd be about 20 people on the dish and they'd turn it on and everyone would fall off. That was in Coney Island. Coney Island had that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, my father and I would do that. And then they put you on a chair and the chair would like sort of leap forward and you'd slide down to the exit. And um, I was so happy because, you know, I loved both my parents and I was so lucky that one of them was willing to take me on rides and um, the other one was, uh, you know, not at that point participating, but at other times she took me. And I think I told this story once, so it's very brief and it's very silly, but this is the way a little kid's mind works. There was um, a place where they had all sorts of strange people and people that would get tied up and locked up. And, you know, it was one of those things they don't really do now because I don't know, might not go over so well. But they had this woman that was locked in a box and then they put knives in and, you know, the whole thing. The knives didn't bother me, but what bothered me was that she was locked in. And so my question to my mother, which a bunch of people heard around was, how is she going to make a wheelie? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was four years old. That was my big worry. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the fun houses were wonderful. Asbury Park had a great one. And um, I guess for insurance, can you imagine all those things now? They wouldn't allow one of those things. Somebody would say their neck was out or their back was out. And, oh, God, yeah. life was fun. And one thing I really, I was very lucky to be by Asbury Park, the Mayfair Theater. I would go in, my father would drop me off at 11 o'clock for the first show, and I would stay there until dark, watching the same movie again and again, and it had an overture and sometimes an intermission, and the concession stand had the big candy bars, and they were like a dollar, and I swear to God, the Hershey's chocolate bars with almonds had more almonds mm -hmm. in them back then, and, we'd, and it was so safe. My father would just drop me off and he'd go home and then he'd come back and he'd come in the theater with a flashlight to look for me. And it was great because anytime you went in, and a lot of people did, they'd go in and they'd watch the movie from the halfway point to the end and then watch the beginning again. It, it, that, it, yeah, well, that was some of your training in uh, film work. So. I was a film maniac since I was little and mm -hmm. I, I had... In my little yearbook, when I graduated grammar school, it said she saw Gone with the Wind 17 times. I saw Gone, I was obsessed with Gone with the Wind. Yeah, well. yeah well, you had it in your DNA. I have a, a yeah. little movie story from summer, but it, you know, uh, it's just a single thing. We had gone up to a Gunquit, Maine for a family vacation. 
And uh, my mother ran into an old friend who happened to have a boy exactly my age. We were both 13. I had never been on a formal date. I had been to a couple of school dances, but never on a date. He asked me to the movies. And there was only one movie in town, and it was uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much. Oh, yes. okay. And he put oh. his arm around the back of the chair, you know, in the movie theater. Well, this is all I needed. And uh, by the way, his name was Larry Stone. I hope you don't, don't get offended, Larry. It's okay what I'm not going to tell you. I've forgiven you. Okay? So that's all I needed. Larry Stone <clears throat> said he would write to me during the summer. Well, I had a crush. You know, you can only imagine. Oh, yeah. Every day for two months, I was the first one at the mailbox. Oh, for goodness sakes. Yeah. He never wrote. I never oh. saw him again. So, but, you know, these are the bumps and the grinds of uh, growing up. And uh, it's okay. It was a great movie. A great movie. <laughs> <laughs> You'll always remember it. Yes. It's funny how certain songs or smells oh, that's from right. a movie will always make you remember distinctly yeah. a part in your life. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. Yeah, it's really, yeah. and and it's funny because they say youth is wasted on the young. But I've, I, I don't know, I guess after COVID and um, hurting myself and, and, and then having less mobility this year, um, I've been thinking a lot about stuff. And it's kind of memories that I forgot about are all of a sudden coming forward. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really, really interesting. And I still have all my same friends from when I was little. I, I still have all my friends. And, you know, we talk just like we did when we were five or six or seven. I mean, that is so you're lucky. I am lucky. But then again, you know, I've lived here my whole life and that's a difference. Yeah. You know, we're in Connecticut and then you came here and a lot of my friends, I mean, my girlfriend, my best friend in grammar school, she moved to Germany and she calls me twice a month on Sunday morning and wow. we're very, very close, you know, because wow. I went to a school that only had 18 kids in it. And it was private and nuns. And so we really, really bonded those kids, you know, against the nuns because the nuns were crazy. <laughs> and, you know, we were scared of them. But, you know, when you're scared as a group, it's uh, it's better than, you know, being yes. alone and singled yes. out, you know. Tell me what the third subject is again. We were talking about uh, a meeting with somebody or something that led to contact with a person that brought you into a whole new world. Yes. yes. Well, I remember one thing that comes to my mind immediately, and that is that I my first book, The Enchanted Self, A Positive Therapy, is based on the concept that in psychology, psychologists, social workers, all you know, even psychiatrists physicians when they see patients we're not we're not trained to do enough to help people realize their talents and strengths and their hidden potential we're very well trained to point out a problem someone has mm -hmm. which sometimes you really need that you've got to have that done but there's so much talent in people that goes unrecognized and of course we ourselves don't recognize the talent right. usually, you know, and we get disturbed and we feel upset and we feel we have nothing to offer and get in a bad mood and, you know, all this stuff. So the book was a lot, it has case studies and it has exercises and the whole thing. Well, I had been working on it for four or five years and a lot of people who write, you're working on a draft forever, forever. And I went to um, a um, convention in um, Atlanta, Georgia. I had a small part on a program, so that was good for me to show up and do a little workshop for an hour. And I remember they have these giant things with books and stalls and jewelry and everything at these things. They're trying to sell the world. 
And I was standing looking around and I absolutely felt pushed, but no one was there. And I literally practically fell on the table where there was an acquisitions editor looking for my type of book. Oh my God. Wow. And we went out for a drink. And before I went to bed that night, I kind of knew she, I would end up getting it published. And it was, she, she helped with the whole that's, thing. That's amazing. So you think the push was at somebody that you didn't see behind you? No. Or was it of like a, you know, universe push? I think it was from the universe. You know, I mean, someone might have come close to me, but this was that feeling when you're, you know, you have to kind of catch wow. your feet so you don't fall. Yeah. It came out of nowhere. Huh. And I would have missed that booth because it wasn't attractive. They weren't selling jewelry. It wasn't a big deal, you know. So that's, what about you? You've got some. Well, I guess I'll tell my bug story. Remember I told you yeah. my bug story? Yeah. Well, I've always been um, a person who collects oddities and loved like Ripley and P.T. Barnum and S.S. Adams, people like that. And I have a big collection of all kind of strange things. And I've been like that since I was a little kid. And when I was young, my father's friend, who was a salesman at McGraw Hill, gave me a Sumatran beetle. I should have brought it so you could see it, but it's down on the wall in the kitchen of all things. And it's a big bug. It's about that big and it has big pinchers and it's in a case and it has Sumatran beetle Borneo bug. So in all the moving and the years, he's fallen off the back sponge part of where he has been pinned. And I have collections of butterflies and all these other weird things. On. So I didn't know what to do. So one of my friends said, why don't you call a taxidermist? Now to me, I don't think a taxidermist around here in Monmouth County. I, I just don't even think about it. I figured it's like a lost art, you know? So I called a couple of taxidermists and they said, no, we do like deer or fish that people mm -hmm. catch. Um, and I came across one guy who actually, I started talking about horses and he said, I wonder if you know my wife. And she got on the phone and she didn't know me, but she knew my horse. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, my horse had won a lot in, in, and I had Elkin for God, 28 years. And he, what, people re remembered him because he was chestnut and he had a flaxen mane and tail and he looked like man of war, you know, or secretary and he was gorgeous. So we started talking and she said, I'm going to put my husband back on because, you know, you seem like, okay. And you're not crazy. And I know who you are. And he has a guy that he knows. So he, he came back on the phone and he said, you can call my friend George Dante. I don't give his number out. And he said, he does all the taxidermy for the Museum of Natural History in New York and the Philadelphia Museums wow. and the Smithsonian. So I called him up and he was as nice as pie. And he said, let me take a picture, send me the bug. And I showed it to him and he said, you can't open that case. That's from the Museum of Natural History in like 1956. And the case alone is such a rarity. Just keep it as it is. And he said, do you have any other stuff? And we started talking, we got very friendly. And I took pictures of my other crazy things. And he said, holy cow, you know, you're really... You're really, you know, not just whistling Dixie here. You've got some really cool stuff. So we became friends and he was doing a, 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 a thing at the museum in New York. And he had just stuffed or preserved a coasalin, which is the ancient prehistoric fish, if anybody's seen that. But and so I never thought in a thousand years I would have contact and that always fascinated me. I always wanted to like do the windows in the museums and, you know, put the little bird there and put the grass there mm -hmm. and everything. And to know him and to talk to him. And he invited me up to his 80,000 square foot place where oh he's all this. And I used to go to this place in New York called Maxilla and Mandible where I bought some of my collections and it closed. But he said, you know about that. So, you know, when you know about things, it makes you seem more 
sincere to people. Mm-hmm. And he invited me up and it's just the greatest thing to have this friend. That's amazing. I mean, what a fantastic job in life. It's like playing, you know, it's, it's, and he's a young guy. He's, he's only about 42 years old. That's so very, very interesting. So that's my little story that I thought of. I'm sure I have others, but I can't think of them right off the top of my head. Yeah. So I don't know. Anything else, Barb, that you can think about that you want to talk about? Well, I think I would like, normally I don't share an award or, well, I haven't received many awards in life, but I think I would like to share that um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to Connecticut and I was um, taken into the hall, um, the wall of uh, fame, so to speak, from Norwalk High School. Every few years, they pick some people to be on the wall for distinguished work in the world of some sort. And they've had, you know, all sorts of people, business people, people in medicine, people in technology, people in the armed services, uh, just every major branch. And and, um, I have no idea who put my name in, but thank you. It was a lovely idea. And it turned out that this time there were only, um, I was the only woman, there were four men and me. And I looked through the brochure and in general, there were less women than men. And my little talk when I got up to speak reflected that because I am a part of the many generations of women of the picket fence and stay quiet, be careful, don't try to go beyond what your husband can tolerate or a hundred thousand other things. You know, uh, it's a man's world, it's endless. Um, Much of that has changed particularly if you push it to change, but it's, it's changed. But when I gave my talk, I explained how I had come from that world and that um, because of my parents' insistence, particularly my dad who believed every woman should have a career um, and my mother's just magnetism and encouragement and every day the sun was going to shine out better. You know, she was that kind of person. I insisted and I knew I was going to be a professional woman of some sort. And um, yes, it's come true. But what I didn't really realize is the friends, for example, Debbie, the people that have come into my life, Ming Chen, who's recording this, the chance, because, because I insisted and, and stro- strove to, you know, be out there with some sort of professional development, some sort of career, um, open so many doors of friends and acquaintances and, and um, people that uh, shared similar thoughts. And I guess I bring that back to um, the whole topic of transitions and the uh, coincidences in life that I think if we, you know, we've been through a very hard time with the pandemic, everybody. I believe we don't even know the full results. I myself was house too housebound almost for two years. I mean, I'm working my way out just to force myself out of the house every day. But um, I think that it's very important to realize that we do make, we don't completely make our lives. Some things are destiny and DNA and all sorts of stuff. We make a lot of our lives ourselves and being able to come out of the pandemic with continued hope and vision and helpfulness and uh, a feeling that I'm entitled to a future a better job if that's what I want or family or or the right retirement village, whatever it is that I have some meaning and I have some place in this universe. I'm not just dropped here like a crumb or something. I'm here because there's some destiny, there's some purpose I can pick up on. 
I and I, I hope this, you know, we didn't tell as many funny jokes as sometimes we do, but I hope this um, old time radio kind of gets a little fire in your heart for yourself. That would be my dream on this one. Plus, we didn't have our visit from my cat. I know, and that was precious. And she walked, came in and walked yeah. around and went out the door again. Yeah. I don't know. She's uh, on strike. Well, yeah. What else? Anything you would like to share, Debbie? Um, it's just, you know, the, to me, I just have a summer where I'm going to take it slow. I'm not going to rush. I'm the type of person that if I'm in the bathtub and the phone rings, I jump out. If, you know, I feel I, I'm always on time, like a crazy person. And I, I'm just, I, I guess move too quickly and do things too fast. I'm going to go slower this summer. I'm not going to still try. My time is filled up a lot, but try not to do and say no a little bit sometimes and just take the time to maybe just do one thing a day. That's, that's an obligation. And um, there's things I started like writing a child's children's book. I started, I sent it out. It was too big. That has to be, you know, winnowed down. And I have people to help me, but I have a million irons in the fire. And I think that I have to like really sit down and do a couple of them to my benefit because I do work for other people and um, I have to do my projects as well, which I really haven't done. Absolutely. And yes. make sure we go to that Japanese place to get our foot massage. Oh, our feet massage. Oh, I can yes. give them a plug. Oh, yes. Two things I do want to talk about. That is Apex Foot Massage and Route 9 and Freehold. You will have a Zen experience of foot massage like you were in New York at a $200 spa. It's unbelievable. And the other thing I want to do, a uh, rest in peace to the Inkwell in Long Branch which was a very instrumental part of my college. It was the coolest like beatnik place on second Avenue started on Brighton. Then it moved to second and the food was unique. The atmosphere was unique. They had a famous thing called the Dutch coffee, which was so delicious. It tasted like buttery, you know, chocolate or something. And God knows, nobody knows how to make it. It was like a super, super recipe. And, and there's, I'm just trying to find new things that I like because a lot of the things I did love with COVID are gone. And, um, but anyway, the inkwell, it was very sad for me to hear yeah. that. Yeah. And also uh, the Ray Liotta passed and he's a local guy. He's actually originally from around here, the actor. And he's my, was my mother's doctor's best friend. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm going to take summer. We're both going to enjoy the club. We, we, we are at the same club and we, we it's, it was wonderful over the weekend. That's such a blessing. Yes, um, and I got your key today for you. I got your key. Okay. So uh, remind me next time I will tell the uh, serendipity coincidental story around Theodore Roosevelt and the subway I, ride I took in New York. But I'm going to save it for next time. And okay. we will be back. So you can find me at enchantedself.com. And um, do you want to give any reference to yourself? Yeah, you can find me. I'm mostly a film critic of Deborah Higgins on IMDb. All my stuff is there. And also um, um, and Higgy42 at AOL.com. And you can write, you know, whatever you want to do. If you have suggestions for our show, you can write it under our Facebook post when it is on Facebook. If you have anything that you want to be talked about or brought up or something from the past, nostalgia memories, we're all about old time radio. So please give us ideas. We do have a following and, um, you know, the, it's, it's a great pleasure to talk about these things. Yeah. It really is. So I guess we're going to sign off, huh, Barb? Right. Yeah, we're going to say good night. And right. uh, see you again. Goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful summer till we see you again. Bye-bye.